So you're scrolling through websites, looking at various keyboards, and no matter where you look, you just can't seem to find something that is exactly what you need. The keycaps are the wrong color or wrong profile, the board you want doesn't come with the switches you prefer. Don't worry, I've got an idea. Come over here, let me show you what to do. The massive uprise in hot swappable keyboards means that you don't have to settle for something that doesn't work for you anymore. It's now easier than ever to make your own keyboard that fits exactly your preferences. So in this video, I'm gonna show you how to build your own keyboard and just how easy it really is. Before that though, can I just say a big thank you to Keychron UK for sending me out everything that I needed to make this video. I really appreciate it. And while in this video, I'm using all Keychron products, the rules that we're following here will apply everywhere as long as you're looking at a mechanical keyboard essentially. But before you're ready to build a keyboard, you're gonna to have to figure out exactly what you need. And you're gonna to have to choose the things that are preferential to you. But basically, when you sum it all down, you need three things. A bare bones keyboard, some switches, and some keycaps. So let's take a little bit of a closer look at each one of those three things. Starting out with the keyboard itself, what you're gonna be looking for is a bare bones keyboard, which is hot swappable. What that means is you're getting a keyboard that doesn't have switches or keycaps with it already. It's just the actual keyboard itself. And what hot swappable means is that you're gonna be able to install and remove switches from the PCB or the circuit board that the switches sit in without having to actually solder switches and things in. The, the circuit board will come with hot swappable sockets already soldered onto the board so you can just pop switches in and out really, really easily. Apart from that, so long as it's bare bones and it's hot swappable, the rest of it is all gonna be down to your preference. And that's really the best and worst thing about custom mechanical keyboards is that you've got so much to choose from, it's so hard to choose. So to try and simplify a little bit, I would say the two most important things you choose are gonna be the layout of the keyboard and the connectivity of the keyboard. I think that's gonna make the biggest difference in day-to-day -day use. Layouts are plentiful and which one you choose is mostly gonna be down to where you're based in the world. Most people in the UK or Europe will be using an ISO or ISO layout and most people in the US will be using an ANSI or ANSI layout. I would say try some different layouts if you can because you might find that like me, you're in the UK but you prefer an American layout. But for the sake of muscle memory, it's probably best just to go with whichever layout you're used to using, whichever one you've been using all your life probably stick with it. So aside from the actual key layout, you've also got the keyboard sort of size layout, which comes in various sizes and shapes and things to suit your needs. There's a whole bunch, but the basics are you can get a full keyboard layout, which has all the number keys and the numpad and all that sort of stuff on it. Then you get a TKL, which is a 10 keyless layout. That's basically without the number pad on, it's been chopped off and you get the full rest of the keyboard. Then there's some much smaller options, normally like 60 or 65% keyboards, on those ones, you lose your F keys along the top and you generally get a much more squished layout. Some don't even have arrow keys. You have to press a modifier like function or something to be able to turn other keys into arrow keys. And then there's the 75% keyboard layout, which for now is my favorite layout for a keyboard. With a 75% layout, you get all of the function keys along the top and you get the arrow keys as well. And, but the keyboard's kind of squished in a little bit. You lose like some of your print screen buttons, stuff like that. You only have three keys down the side. And if you're lucky, you might get a little volume knob on the top as well. Personally, I think that's the best compromise between a compact size and having full functionality on the keyboard, but only you will know what keys you need and what you will miss if it's not there. And then the reason I say connectivity is gonna be an important thing is because it's really gonna depend on your use case. Are you happy to have a USB cable constantly on your desk to connect it to your computer? Uh, do you want wireless? Do you need 2.4 gigahertz wireless so you've got a super fast connection? for maybe gaming or something like that without a wire. Maybe Bluetooth is important for you. Maybe connecting Bluetooth to multiple devices is important to you, which it is for me. I switch between my Mac and my PC all the time on my keyboard. Therefore, having multi-connection Bluetooth to different devices so I can press a hotkey and be controlling one or the other is vital for me. So think about it long and hard because you can't change those two things after the fact. But let's face it, if you're watching this video, you're probably gonna be buying more keyboards real soon. So. Apologies for your newfound addiction. Aside from that, there's gonna be a lot of other things you can choose from. What color do you want it to be? What materials do you want it to be made from? Metal, plastic, there's all kinds of things out there. What kind of battery life do you need? Then there's other options like, does it have weights in it? Does it have sound dampening foam inside? Do you need it to be gasket mounted so it's kind of bouncy? I don't wanna dig into all those specifics for those things too much in this video, so I'm trying to keep it simple where I can. But if you come across any of those options, maybe give them a little Google, 
figure out what they mean and see if it's something you think you want. The hardest thing about keyboards is you don't really know what you want until you try it. So if you've got friends with keyboards and different switches, get hands on with them wherever you can. Try and get an idea of what you do like, what you don't like. But I think that's why we all end up with so many is because you just want to try everything to try and find what's perfect for you. Right, so we've picked the keyboard. In this video, I've got the Keychron Q1 Pro. It's a super solid metal bodied keyboard. It's gasket mounted. It includes sound dampening foam. It's got a full RGB backlight, a volume knob, and most importantly for me, it's got Bluetooth that will allow me to quickly switch between my PC and my Mac. Now we're gonna need some switches. If you're not aware, the switch is the actual part in the keyboard that actually moves up and down. And that's what registers that you've pressed the button when you press it. Again, there's a million options and far too many to go into in this video. But if you're watching this, I would imagine you're most likely familiar with Cherry MX switches such as the reds, the blues, and the browns, which are the most three common styles, linear, clicky, and tactile. Reds are linear, you press the key, it's really smooth, it just goes up and down in a straight line, and so far, linear switches have always been my personal favorite. Blues are clicky, when you get towards the bottom of the press, there'll be both a feel and a sound of a little click so that you know you've pressed the key. These are probably my least favorite. I don't like the clicky feel or the sound, it almost feels like it's getting stuck at the bottom to me, but again, people love them. So it's all preference. Then there's tactile switches, most commonly known ones, Cherry MX Browns, and they have a sort of tactile bump at the bottom of the press, so you can feel that you've pressed the key, but it's not clicky and it's not as sort of jarring on the sound. It's, it's more of a feeling than a sound or a click. There's then a bunch of different options from millions of different brands, and they have different materials that they're made of different actuation forces, which is basically how hard you have to push it to get it to register. So you're thinking about things such as do you prefer a heavier or a lighter press on the key? And again, unfortunately, the only way to really know is to try them all. So today, in an effort of trying them all, I'm gonna be using something a little bit different. My favorite switch up until now has been the Gatoron Milky Yellow Pros and that's what I've used in several keyboards now. They're a linear switch, much like a Cherry MX Red, but they've got a little bit more of a harder actuation force. But today, we're gonna to be using Keychron's own K-Pro Mint switches. They're actually a tactile switch, but the little bump pop feeling of pressing it down is towards the top of the press rather than near the bottom. They're actually based on the much heralded Holy Panda switches, which many people will say are the best keyboard switches that ever existed. Keychron were kind enough to send me both the Mint and Banana switches from their K-Pro line, both of which are essentially the same, but the Mint ones have a harder actuation force. The Banana ones are a little bit easier to press. The only other thing I would say on switches is look for some switches that say that they're factory lubricated. Switches that haven't been lubricated can feel a bit sort of crunchy when you press them or they can make strange sounds. Until more recently, it was very common for people to buy unlubricated switches and lubricate them themselves. Factory lubing has become much better in recent times. So you can save yourself your hassle of taking all the switches apart and painting them with a little paintbrush. Just get some factory lube switches for now. If you want to do that at a later date, we can dig in deeper. I've done it before, check previous videos. But I think that's a little bit far for this video. The last thing you're going to want is keycaps. And this is where you can kind of let your creativity run free because you can get all the colors and shapes and sizes and different heights and shorter keys and flatter keys and stepped profiles and all kinds of different stuff. This is where you can really make a keyboard look how you want it to look, but it will also affect how it feels to type on as well. Some profiles such as XDA will give you a flat keyboard, whereas some like an OEM profile are a bit taller and they're kind of stepped between the rows so you can feel which row you're on. Once again, trying them is the only way you're ever gonna know for sure what you prefer. But the most important thing here is probably the layout. Make sure that whatever keycaps you do buy have the right layout for whichever keyboard you chose earlier on in the video because if they don't, you're gonna have that really awkward thing where you're putting your keycaps on and there's gonna be a UK enter key which doesn't fit an American enter key or you're gonna have your right control button is gonna be too big and it won't fit or worse, you have gaps in between. You don't want that to happen. So I found the best way to actually combat this is most keycap sets will show you an actual single picture which has got a picture of every single keycap that's included in the set. Compare that picture to the picture of the keyboard that you're buying and just make sure that all those bases are covered and you're not gonna be missing keys or have keys that don't fit. While talking about keycaps, you can also go down the line of the material they're made of, PBT, ABS, there's ceramic keycaps, all kinds of stuff out there at the moment. If you wanna look into that, have a little Google about to see which one you think you'll prefer. But for the sake of this video, I would say pick something that you really love the look of. Let's get excited about this first keyboard. Have something that we love to look at that looks really, really cool and keycaps are the easiest thing to change at a later date. And also if you're a Mac user like myself, 
Don't forget about the Mac specific keys. If you need command and option keys and stuff like that on your layout, a lot of keycap sets don't have those options on them. So look for them. Otherwise you end up like me and you've got a Windows key where your command key should be and it's a little bit weird. Some of them will also have the volume and mission control buttons and stuff printed along the F row keys, which is handy to have. So if you think you need those, look for those. It might not bother you, it might bother you. You might use a PC only. Okay, so that was a whole lot of information, but I promise you now we're onto the easy part and that's actually building the keyboard. It's nowhere near as scary as it sounds when you say building a keyboard, although it is a little bit repetitive. Basically, all we need to do is install the switches and put the keycaps on and then we're ready to go. The switches are probably the slightly trickier part of the two, but it's really okay once you've done a couple of them. Essentially, all you have to do is line them up and press them in. And depending on what switches you bought, you're probably going to have spare switches. So don't worry too much if you mess anything up. You wanna look at the little sockets on the PCB itself on the keyboard. For some keyboards, you might find taking it apart a bit will make it a little bit easier to get access to the PCB. In this case, or in most cases, I don't think it's necessary. It just makes it easier. In this case, I'm not going to because I want to make it easy for you guys. So basically, you're going to want to look at the little sockets on the PCB, look at the switches, make sure they're lined up correctly, hold the switch as straight as possible, and push it straight down until it clips into the plate that sits above the PCB. I tend to find a kind of rolling action, starting from the side where the two brass pins are, kind of pushing that first and rolling it in and then pressing down hard but you'll figure it out, it's a, there's a bit of a feel to it. But yeah, it's basically as easy as that. You line them up and you push them in. Do be careful for the occasional key that's oriented differently. For example, on a UK layout keyboard, the enter key is often rotated 90 degrees compared to all the other keys on the keyboard, but you can easily see where it matches up and which way you need to put it in. Just be careful not to bend the pins, get it in the wrong orientation, get it not quite straight, and do check the switches before you put them in to make sure those little brass pins are straight. Occasionally, they will come from the factory with a bend in them. Key even even gives us this little handy card to remind us of that. But if you do bend one, don't worry, we'll cover what happens later on. And then once all the switches are in, it's time for keycaps. The switches have a small little cross-headed peg almost on them. The keycaps have like a cross-headed receptacle on them. And you push the peg into the receptacle and push it down and your keycaps are on. Not quite that simple. You have to do it a lot of times, like so many times. Again, another big shout out to Keychron here though, because the way their keycaps come packaged are in a nice box, they're all laid out and they're all in the right order. So literally it makes it so easy to take them out of the box and place them one by one. Some other keycaps that I bought in the past, particularly like cheaper ones from Amazon and stuff like that, they come like this and it's a mess. You spend way more time looking for the right keycap than you do actually putting the keycaps on the board. It's almost like you've bought a keycap set that comes with a free jigsaw puzzle. Once they're all on, the last thing you're gonna to wanna to do is connect it up to your computer and make sure that it's all working okay. I would usually plug it in by USB first of all, because you don't know how much battery you've got and it's gonna avoid any connectivity issues, you know everything's good. Plug it in by USB and then check out one of the many keyboard testing websites. If you Google keyboard test, our load will come up. In this video, I'm using VIA, and basically you just press every single key on your keyboard, and the screen will show you whether that's registered a press or not. For me, this time around, they all work except for the G key, which I was actually kind of happy about because it means I get to show you what to do if that happens for you. Here's me fixing it. Okay, so I've just got this whole keyboard sorted out, everything's loaded up. I've done the uh, tester on the VIA website, and the G key's not working. All the others make a nice little noise. At least they would if I had an active window. She's not working, so if that happens for you, you're probably going to need to just swap the switch out, but uh, let's test it and try and fix it where the G key is, and we'll try and see if we can figure out what's going on. You're going to need one of these, which is like a little keycap switch puller tool. There should be one come with your keyboard. You use this side like this to pull your keycap off. You have to give it quite a tug. And then these two little pincy bits will go either side of your switch. So there's like two little notches in there that it will grab into. You're gonna have to pinch it together fairly hard and probably turn your keyboard off before you do this. Might be sensible, but you're literally gonna pinch it and pull it out and have a look at your switch. And we can see straight away the culprit one of the pins is bent on there, so I, it wasn't bent putting it in because I did check them all before I put them in, so I must have bent it while I was putting it in there. So hard to get in focus on this camera, but you can see if I get a new switch, hopefully you'll be able to see the difference on there. 
So this side, if you look at that, you can see the little tiny little leg on the right hand side one has bent. So hopefully if we take this new switch, and we pop that in there and we give it a little press and we put our G key cap back on and we turn the keyboard back on with any luck when we press G can you hear it? zoom back out it works sorted simple as that so don't panic if something goes wrong don't panic and there you have it, you did it. You built your own custom keyboard and you've got exactly the specs that you wanted. And now there's just one more thing to do, right? Open up the Monkey Type website and get tapping. Let's see how your brand new keyboard sounds. Thanks for watching, guys.